my first question, I, uh, I'm going to steal from my friend Michaela, who suggested that my first question be, Benjamin, what made you think that people would want to fucking read about you? Yeah, totally. Well, it's a good question and one that I've thrown at Michaela as well because she's <laughs> written her own memoir too. Look, I write for a magazine called Frankie. I'm not sure if any of you saw it on the 7.30 report featuring Joe Walker, my editor, just there recently. But I've been writing for this magazine for the past... <laughs> for the past six years, and I didn't think that uh, myself or my family were necessarily great material to use until um, the founding editor, Louise, commissioned all the senior writers to write a piece for Frankie called My Mother's Advice. And that got me thinking in terms of what advice my mother had actually given us over the years. And the clearest memory that I had was my mother bellowing to my three sisters. I come from quite a large family. Um, it's time to have a shower now. And if you don't shower soon, your vagina will grow worms. <laughs> so I wrote about that. and <laughs> Helpful tip for all Frankie readers. Totally. Yeah. Uh, it, it sounded bad in Cantonese, but I realise it sounds much worse in English. <laughs> And, pe and people responded to that. They, they liked that. They thought it was outrageous. They thought it was hilarious. So from that point onwards, I thought, well, Mum, you, you've given me a gift, really. That, those whole, that whole childhood teenage period where I thought she was an absolute freak, which she is, like all of us are, in our own special way, that, that's something to be embraced as well. Mm. Absolutely. How does your mum feel about it? She's uh, a huge part of this book, a hilarious part of this book. Is she loving it? Does she feel like a little bit of a celebrity? I, I recently launched this book at, um, in my hometown of Brisbane. I'm not sure if you've heard of Brisbane. Um, <laughs> Brisbane uh, and an independent bookstore there called Avid Reader, where I used to work. And she was actually a part of the second evening of the launch. And she actually got up on stage and she was asked that question, how do you feel, Jenny, having all of this on public display? And her first answer was, oh, a little embarrassed. I'm like, I'm not embarrassed. She, 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 I think she appreciates the fact that she's given this sort of platform. I mean, I, 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 I try to write about all my family members with, with love because I think they're really gorgeous and funny and strange and wonderful. Um, and I think my mum understands that as well. And I think she... Okay, my mother, let me explain. My mother, within the first few minutes of meeting you, will ask you a few things. One, do you plan to have children? Two, do you have children? Three, if you do have children, tell me in precise and graphic terms what that childbirth experience was like. <laughs> and um, she will also give you advice if you haven't had um, children yet. And these are not like genteel mother, mother to mother sort of um, tips. It's more like if you have a baby, don't let your vagina tear naturally. Um, make sure that your doctor stitches you up instead. And this is within the first five minutes of you meeting her. So I, I sort of wrote about that those sort of experiences I've had with my mother and her sharing that information. And it was interesting, after the, after the launch where she talked about that stuff as well, you know, it, it's still a little freaky when she does that sort of mm. stuff. But afterwards, when the event was finished, you saw all these women rush towards my mother and suddenly there was this sharing circle, circle of childbirth stories and it got really, really graphic really, really quickly. And women came up to me afterwards and said, your mother's amazing. I don't get to talk about this sort of stuff with, with other people usually. So that I sounds like an opening for a Frankie column, I think, for Jenny. Yeah, you reckon, Jo? Yeah. <laughs> That's frightening. <laughs> um, now, I, your mum is obviously a huge character in the book. I'm curious about um, your younger siblings, your mm. two sisters, seem very sort of exuberant as well. But your older yes. siblings seem a little bit calmer, particularly your brother. Mm. Is that Andrew? Andrew, that's right. Yeah, Good Andrew, work. thank you. I read the book. I thought I would <laughs> when I turned up here. Um, so how does, how does how do, like, people like Andrew, how is he reacting to seeing himself in the book? Because he seems a little bit more straight and narrow, less vagina talk, from what I could pick up in the book. Yeah, yeah. Andrew, Andrew will be the sibling in the 
family Christmas situation uh, where he will be, I mean, I do a lot of burying my head in my hands as well, but he will do it first because Andrew does not want to engage with dirty talk. When my mother talks about the intimate um, workings of her biology, let's, let's, let's say it like that. Um, she he, talks about the intimate workings of your biology too. As from well. Memory. The words penis hole yeah, to be jumping out of your book a fair bit. quite a bit. <laughs> um, that was when she wanted to convey how painful childbirth was and she told me to imagine a lemon coming out of my penis hole, except this lemon has limbs. Um, which I thought was quite literary, really. Uh, Andrew is quite reserved and quite a private person, uh, but I think that actually helps. You know, he's not, uh, you know, a big reader or involved in that sort of scene, so he sort of thinks, oh, a book is out there, and he just sort of rides with it. He's actually, he's actually quite fine with things. Mm. The, someone that you've been compared to a fair bit in all the interviews that I've read is David Sedaris. Obviously, mm. um, Sedaris writes about his family very affectionately as well. It's not just because of, um, I don't know if I'm doing a spoiler, but that you're gay oh. as well, as is David Sedaris. Um, but obviously, it's not just that, but it's also because of just how intimately you sort of write about your family and things like that. But I have a feeling just from, from reading this that your stories about your family are almost a little bit more heartfelt. Dave. The, when I, was, I just went over your book when I was in the cafe over the road mm. and what I kind of loved about it was that there are many really funny chapters talking about vaginas and that's excellent and I think that's essential in any book but <laughs> I, I still cried rereading the chapter over the road. The, oh. You talk very beautifully about your love for Scott who I guess is your Hugh if you're a David Sedaris. Yeah, fan. my uh, Hugh. How, does, how is your Hugh? Just, I hope Scott's liking that. Uh, how's, how does Scott feel about this? I guess he's a musician as well so I guess you're both probably writing about each other in some way. Maybe we can ask him. Where is he? No, um, yeah, oh, there he is. He's right there. <laughs> he, um, he's good at being fodder for my writing. I guess I'm fodder for his songwriting mm. as well. So I think, I think uh, I'm not going to, you know, write about the inner workings of our relationship necessarily and how that all works. I think there are some things to be kept private. Um, what? It- yeah, yeah, but when I mischaracterise him. Um, As what? What was the mis... Well, look, I mean, I, I, when I write things, I pass drafts by everyone because I know that, like, when I wrote about my brother, I'm writing about him from the perspective of when I was 12 years old and it was a long time ago. So I pass drafts by him and he says, well, I wouldn't have necessarily sworn that much at that age and I passed stuff by Scott and he's just like you've ruined me you've you've, <laughs> you've you've done a character assassination on me which is not true I write about him with love as well he's not even paying attention so <laughs> he's, through a book out he's just flicking through a book but it, but yeah it's fine I, I actually like my policy is to pass drafts by everyone I write about to give them some sort of in which Form case, I reply. love how much your family gave the okay for this book because some of those chapters are very amazing, like really, really amazing. And your mum, I just, I'm in love with her. I'm a bit obsessed with your mum, and I really yeah. want to go to Queensland so I can meet her. Totally. Um, what about a movie version of this book? Is that ever going to happen? Have you had interest? Starring already? Lee Lin Chin. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, does Lee Lin Chin act? Um, yeah, no, no, the, there are no plans for a movie as yet, Jess, and I'm not sure <laughs> who would be cast in those roles. I would just like to be the neighbour or something. Yeah, like yeah, be you'll, be the, you'll be the nosy neighbour. Uh, yeah, we can just, we, we'll just re, We'll just recast the home song stories and, um, yeah, with a, with, a laugh, with a laugh track instead, yeah. <laughs> That's what it needed. It would have done a lot better. <laughs> <laughs> That's grim. Yeah, mm. and, and inappropriate. Um, has anyone got any questions out in the crowd? Um, for Ben at all? The, 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 sir? Hello. Hello. Um, I was wondering two things. No offence to you, baby, but how do you feel about... Okay, so the first question was about, about labels, about being gay and being Asian, or I like to make a compound word of the two and just call myself Gaysian because <laughs> it just rolls off the tongue. Um, I have no problem with that because I'm 
those two things as well. And I don't think, you know, this is this book is told from the perspective of someone who is young, gay, and Asian. Um, but I don't think you need to be any of those things to to get it. It's a it's a sort of um, a story about anyone's family, really, and we all bring our unique perspectives into family life. So if you want to call me those things, that's cool because that's what I am. Um, so I don't have any problem with that. The second thing was about <laughs> using using this as a platform to become an... Angry homosexual. Angry homosexual. Um, I'll think about that. If, the, if offers come my way to write a column called Angry Homosexual <laughs> Weekly, I, I, I could do that. Um, there's... Like it, the thing about this book as well is that there are some certain stories in there that are really resonating with me now, mm. particularly the one where you talk about your family um, from Hong Kong who had come out here. So when you were a kid, and it's it's a really interesting perspective on uh, asylum seekers. So your your mother's mm. family all came out here in the mid eighties. Yeah. Um, and well, if you want to explain what happened. So so this was the mid eighties, and I was I was really young, so I have no recollection of how any of this happened or what had happened. The story basically starts off with me as a child growing up in this in this um, brick home and there's just stuff all throughout the house and it's actually still in my mother's house and we had no idea how well I had no idea really how this stuff had gotten into our house so clothes of people I had never met um, board games all this sort of weird sort of junk everywhere and it wasn't like anyone had lived in this house before us so it definitely came from somewhere else and years and years later, you know, as, as all of us do when we start to ask those questions like, what is this stuff? Where is it from? I found out this incredible story about how my mother's extended family basically came over to Australia as illegal immigrants and were, well, to cut a long story short, they were found out by the federal police. It was actually quite exciting. There were high-speed chases down the road and everything. And this made front page news in the Queensland and well in the Queensland newspapers for about a month, and everyone knew my um, my mum's family name by name, and it, it was sort of incredible because afterwards they they did all get deported. This is maybe a gang of over ten people, one by one. This sort of slow trickle through Villawood and then through. Um, and then through the airport as well. And I didn't really have any appreciation or understanding of how or why any of this had happened until I started, well, really writing the book and asking those questions as well. So I went to the State Library of Queensland and I found all the microfilm archives of, of all of this stuff. It's really incredible stuff. And I actually um, printed it all out and made a little booklet of it for my family as well. And uh, I guess I really wanted to write that story, not because it was my story, but because it made me proud to come from a family that was really resilient and had endured all of this. It, to it told a really interesting story about Australia's race relations at that point in history as well. And this is, this is the mid-80s that all of this happened, yeah, yeah mid to late-80s? Yeah, that's right. What I found really interesting is, is, from what I could tell from the book, that the community around you, where you lived, were incredibly supportive. That's right. You, you know, your family had, had opened up a restaurant. They were really loved by the community. They were big members in the community. Mm. For, for, as you put it in the book, you know, for illegal immigrants, they were living their life incredibly publicly. And the idea that there were, that there were campaigns in, in the primary schools and letter writing to the papers mm. and that, that everyone was really behind trying to get your family to stay, it was such an interesting perspective because I only ever really hear, particularly back then, of, of stories where, you know, so much racism and it was actually really heartwarming to think that somewhere in Queensland there was a whole community rooting for you guys to stay. Yeah. And so, and so sad that, that you obviously, your, your family didn't get to stay. I think, you know, all of this was leading up, like we're talking about the mid-80s and we're leading up to Expo 88 in Queensland. Any of you who come from Queensland know exactly what I'm talking about. So this really big embrace of, of multiculturalism. Um, it really surprised me going through the newspaper articles, like you say, Jess, that the tone of it was really supportive of my family. So one interesting detail of all of this happening was that my cousin, my younger cousin Tiffany, was born on the day after my uncles and aunties were detained in Villawood. So you've got the majority of them detained in Villawood and then um, my auntie Esther, who is heavily pregnant, gives birth the next day. Now these are all illegal immigrants 
And then you've got a young girl born in the country who's an Australian citizen. So really interesting catch, right? Really great news story as well. So you've got the front pages saying, baby Tiffany's an Aussie, let, I love that. let I love her that. stay. <laughs> and, and I just thought that was really interesting because you wouldn't... Um, I don't think that would necessarily be the tone of how that story would be written nowadays, necessarily. I don't know. Hmm. Uh, any other questions out there? The Monopoly sets. What's that? You didn't get to the bottom of where those, those board games came from. Okay, so basically, the question was, where did all those board games come from? Uh, they had to leave in a really big rush which is what happens when you get thrown out of the country. You're just thrown onto a plane with a few overnight bags and then you're shipped off. And so they left, they, they saw that we had a relatively large three-bedroom home and um, we stowed away all their stuff in our storage closet. So, of course... Three-bedroom home, five... Oh, three kids at the time. Yeah. Oh, oh your mum would have been pregnant with... Yeah, I feel she like was I know pregnant. your yeah, family yeah, yeah, so you know, intimately. You do, you no, do. Come no, over no. for dinner. I will, I want yeah. to. It's my dream. Um, yeah. yeah, so there were, there were four kids in a three-bedroom house, so uh, six people in a three-bedroom house at mm. that stage. And plenty then, of room. Plenty of room. And so they just really... We just really shoved everything into the storage closets. So my siblings and I... You know, it sounds Dickensian. We didn't grow up with a wardrobe. We, we, we just used shelves because all of, all of the wardrobe space was taken up with all this other stuff from, from my extended family. And it's still sort of there. And we, are, we slowly go for archaeological digs sometimes. It's a bit, you know, it's a little bit painful to do mm, all absolutely. that stuff um, for my mother. Well, your Uncle Toby, that in, in the book, your Uncle Toby comes over and tries to clean it up. He tries to clean it up. And it doesn't really quite work mm. out quite well, no. Uh, any other questions? I'll go on. Do you want childbirth advice? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, do you want me to give you? No, yeah, no, yeah. Yeah. Ben. <laughs> no I think I've Ow. already... <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, I, I feel like I need, I, I need my mother here because she does all the, like, the gestures as she's telling the stories as well that I can't really quite convey here. And there's another story, because, I mean, it's such a funny book, and I, I do want to have that home. It is a really funny book, but there's so many really beautiful moments. And there was the other week I was driving with a friend. He was driving, and um, we were stuck in traffic. We didn't want to listen to the radio. So I said, oh, I'll read you a funny story from Ben Law's oh, book as an audio sense. book. I thought that was hard <laughs> in the dark, but I had a crack at it. And I managed to pick the saddest story in there. And as my friend George was driving, he was like, this is really making me a bit upset. Um, Sorry. Yeah, no, in a, in a really great way. But um, your father is... Mm. is um, he's not, I don't want to say less vivid of a character. He's really vivid, but he's um, he seems a quieter. He, he works all the time. Mm. Um but yet, you know, the portrait that's painted of him in the book as well is, I mean, he's very lovable. But his story about his his father, mm. are you able to talk a little bit about that? Well, my dad's a really interesting character. He's, he works and still works seven days and nights a week. He'll work through Christmas as well. He's a restaurant proprietor. He used to run Chinese restaurants until Chinese food became unpopular and now runs a Thai restaurant because Asians are the same, right? <laughs> and no one can tell the difference. So, um, so he's, always, he's always really worked hard and when you have a family of, of five children, you really do have to work hard to do all of that. The story that I write in the book is about my quest to find Dad the perfect gift I don't know, have, have you guys encountered similar difficulties? Yeah. Like, dads are just awful to buy stuff for. They're really difficult, especially when you have a dad who works so much that they don't actually have time to develop any hobbies, right? So I got into this thing where I just started giving my dad underwear over and over again. But the first time, one of the first times I did it was a failure because he doesn't like stuff that's made in China. Um, to which I will always reply, well, you were made in China. What is your problem with all of this? So I think he's working through some own issues there. Uh, so what, what, I, what I got a sense of um, in writing this story, I wanted to basically question, you know, why doesn't Dad really understand the, the gift-giving process between, between parent and, and son? 
And what I found out through talking to him was this really incredible story. And, you know, you guys, if you, if you don't know the full account of your parents' story, it's not until you actually sit down and say, can I interview you, that all this stuff really comes out. You put a dictaphone in front of someone. It's incredible. What I found out was that my dad, who grew up in China, his father left and went to San Francisco to go and find money um, to build the family fortune, and he'd wire money back to China um, to support my dad and his mum. And then when my dad was 12, he was going to meet his dad for the first time. He was sailing back from San Francisco. And on the very day that they met each other face to face, he was just like, hey, you're my son. And then he basically collapsed dead. It's really, really shocking. Like, it's almost funny you shocking. Make, you couldn't no, make it up at all. It, it, it's, it's the stuff out of fiction. And I think I flagged that in the book. Like, what I'm about to say really... You know, if you wrote it as a story, it would sound contrived. But it really gave me a sense of, you know, my dad never really got to develop his own relationship with his father. And I guess from that, um, I sort of reflected on my own relationship with him as well. Mm. Yes, you, you're the only one with your hand up. Yes, <laughs> definitely you, sir. Definitely. Well, growing up, you know, as an Asian in a foreign country, have you ever felt like you've been discriminated against? Um, other people. Yeah, look, I, I grew up in regional Queensland and uh, the Sunshine Coast, which is an hour away from Brisbane, we can, we can claim that. It's regional Queensland. So, you, you know, I, I've written this in Frankie before, but you drive only a few minutes out of where I grew up and you could almost hear the banjo start up from <laughs> Deliverance, really. Um, and I do write about it in the book a little of, um, of when Pauline Hanson came into national politics. This was sort of in the mid-ish sort of 90s. And... It was really interesting how many students at the school that we went to whose parents were quite fervent One Nation supporters as well. And certainly, um, you know, I talked to people from Melbourne and how they, were, um, they went to a predominantly Asian school. But, you know, my family, we were the Asian kids, like we were the Asians. It wasn't, it wasn't so much like bullying or discrimination or anything like that, but certainly... I remember those fun times during um, those mid-90s when Pauline Hanson became really popular where cars would drive by you and scream stuff, and that was always fun. Um, and you didn't really know how to respond to that. Because, you know, because I was born and grew up here, it's not like I identify strongly as being um, a Hong Kong Chinese person necessarily. I do to an extent, but, you know, this is, this is my place as well. So... Um, yeah, I don't feel it too much nowadays. I live, I live in Brisbane and I feel like that's two-thirds Asian anyway. <laughs> um, but yeah, th there's, always, there's always something there. And I think um, any of us who do come from a visibly different ethnic background just feel that sort of underlying thing sometimes. Hmm. Yes? No, I'm really shit at it. Um, and there's a chapter about this called Tone Deaf. Because Cantonese is a tone, tonal language. There are nine different tones, okay? Which, so you take the, the syllable gaw, and that means to cross the road. You say gaw gaw, that means brother. You say um, gaw. Do you know what so, I learned from the book? Goo goo. Yeah, 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 okay, I'll say it, okay. So this is the classic, this is Cantonese. Gaw 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 gaw, gaw 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 gaw. And what that means is <laughs> that brother over there is taller than that brother over there. I wonder how you found the ads for the Gogo Mobile. Gogo, <laughs> yeah, Gogo Mobile. Yeah, one of my favourite. One of my favourite. Cantonese is a thrillingly funny language. Like one of my um, favourite shows growing up. Not so much now. It was Hey Hey It's Saturday. Like I really loved it as a kid. Yeah, just give me a break. But. Uh, when Hey Hey was at its peak was when... Um, when was that specifically? <laughs> I'm not, Between I'm not sure. June that's a, that's and a, September really, of 1987, I believe. Yeah. That's a really good question. Um, but of course, my relatives always found Hey Hey really funny because Hey 
pronounced in a certain way in Cantonese means vagina. So it was like <laughs> vagina, vagina, Which would have it's improved Saturday. The show <laughs> immensely. Um, so anyway, my, my Cantonese is quite appalling. And one of the stories is about how my boyfriend Scott actually enrolled me in Cantonese classes for I think it was my 18th or 21st birthday because he he just thought it was really sad that I had access to this language that I wasn't using and I thought it was sad as well my mother and father speak 100% Cantonese to me and I I get it I, I understand it but I, I can't speak it back and these Cantonese classes were an absolute disaster like the, I I I am not gifted at languages. I'm learning Mandarin at the moment because I'm about to go to China for two months. And um, What are you going to be doing in China for two months? I will come to that, Jen. I can't <laughs> wait. <laughs> and um, I, I'm having enough problems with numerals as it is. So, uh, yeah, but thank you for that question. Not so great. That's me. Wait, you come to the bit where you go to... Hmm? China for two months. Okay, so I'm gonna. Uh, this is actually this is actually for the next book that that I'm writing. So a... I've asked a really poignant question. Yeah. Wow. Um, the next book that I am about to write is um, sort of a travel adventure throughout uh, throughout Asia, and it's going to be called Gaysia. Well, that's the working <laughs> title, and it's going to be exploring queer communities throughout the continent and I've just started writing it and I spent um, a few weeks in May um, going backstage with Thailand's biggest transsexual beauty pageant. It was amazing. I saw your photos You've seen today the photos. and they're really hot. Yeah, they're pretty, they're babes. Um, so that's the first chapter and then um, China is, is coming up next, unearthing stories that way as well, which will be really Unearthed interesting. Unearthed China. Yeah, that's right.